first year of ownership, I did ceramic coating on the paint, all the coating changes that I wanted to do, turbo inlet pipe, the resonator delete, the new speed power module, piggyback tune, all the paddles, and a couple of other little things that I probably can't remember at this point. Hello folks, welcome to Net Cruiser Cars. This, this is my Volkswagen Golf R 2018, and it's in pretty good condition. I've just had it for just over a year now. This is in pearl white paint. It's, it's got a nice, real nice pearl to it. And I have ceramic coated this. So I just want to go over some of the first things I've done in the first year of ownership, some of the pros and cons, and just some of my opinions that we've had along the way. So let me put you in the car and we'll go for a drive. This is a real R. A lot of people don't think it is because I've got these wheels on it, but this is just because it's winter time, right? Look at all the winter. So yeah, real quad exhaust tips. Pretty dirty because it's winter time, but let's go for a ride. Leather seats are holding up pretty well. I am fairly conscious of wear, so I try and make sure that I don't put too much pressure on these bolsters, but they're excellent. And then really the only thing I've noticed is that there's a little bit of a wrinkle in the center section, but that's pretty normal for all leathers. And overall, my leather seats are holding up very well. The back seat, I always have a dog protector on it, so I don't even really use them. I just use it for storage. Really nice thing about a hatchback is how much storage you have. Tons and tons of storage in here, plus all the back is full as well. Full of fun RC stuff that I'm about to go do this weekend. That was telling me proximity key. So I have just put over 18,000 kilometers on this and I'm about two or three weeks beyond the, uh, the one year of ownership. All right guys, I just drove the Golf R and holy crap, it exceeded all my expectations. Do I need a Golf R? <laughs> I want a Golf R. Heck yeah, I do. So I was around 17,000 at the first year, which is high for me. Usually I'm between 13 and 15,000, but I really like driving this car a lot. So I've gone on some pretty long road trips and stuff, and it's just a joy to drive. So let me go through a bunch of the things that I like and I don't like about it, and we'll go for a long drive. Golf R, startup sequence, full digital dash, navigation, eight inch touchscreen, 300 horsepower, all wheel drive. All right, welcome to inside of the Golf R. We're gonna go for a bit of a drive. And uh, overall, the only thing that I've done to this car for, for mods of interior space has been to add these paddles on. And these paddles are really nice. Uh, I have made a video about these as well. These are called the Speedwow paddles and they're excellent. I really like them. Let's go for a drive and I'll talk to you about this car. just a few minutes after I set off. The engine oil is not even up to temp yet, but I just wanted to go overcome some of the things I've done to this car for mods in its first year. A lot of it has been through OBD11 that was programming the computer interface and the CAN bus interface to do specific things that I wanted. And I've made quite a few videos about that. Even the one where I'm showing to adjust colors on the display that you don't normally have has over 400,000 views now in just one year. People love this being able to code extra features into your car. And there's a couple of big ones that I've done that I really, really like the most. My favorite coding upgrade that I've done is the lane assist. Out of box, it, it has kind of lane departure warning support where it uses the front camera that's in the windshield and it causes it to kind of bounce between lanes like a drunk driver. And I never really liked how that worked and that was its lane assist. Now, after the upgrade that I've done, which I am gonna make a separate video about, it now tracks straight. It actually has real lane keeping, even to the point where me just trying to cross over this dotted line here, the car did not want to let that happen. And that unlocked adaptive lane tracking. So now I can turn off or on this. And so I can show you some self-driving here. As long as I have two green lines in my dashboard, which this is the digital display, so I get a lot of information in here. As long as I've got two green lines, I know that it's self-driving. So if I just let go, it'll track itself straight. The car is currently now driving itself for the most part, and it'll do this for 30 seconds at a time. Now previously, so it's got a slight bend here, it's gonna do it all for me, and I just have to monitor it. It'll only do this for 30 seconds at a time. Previously, and now it's telling me to take over steering. Previously, it would, it would have bounced around like a drunk driver, it would have not done that smooth. So that is the, my favorite coding upgrade I've done. It is a real legitimate extra feature that I didn't have before. One of the great things about this car is all of the distance sensors that it has, which is an upgrade when you buy the car. It's the driver assistance package, which is I think the best
best deal of the whole car. It's like under $2,000 and it gives you uh, the collision detection warning, the front radar assist, the lane assist, the, um, what else is there? Oh, the uh, high beam assist. So it does all the high beam, low beam stuff for me. It is an excellent package, well worth it. So here's the benefit of all those sensors and stuff. I'm currently just cruising at 100 kilometers an hour using the radar assisted cruise control and it's coming up on a car in front and the car is automatically slowing down and having the DSG gearbox will allow it to now actually go down gears as well. So I don't believe you can do this functionality with a manual transmission. So that's one of the benefits of having the driver assistance package plus DSG just allows you to have more autonomous driving. So it's even gonna turn this corner for me it's keeping a distance from this car. I'm All I'm having to do is just watch what it's doing. It, it's literally driving itself. Which some of you may not want in a driver's car, but it's nice to be able to have the best of both worlds, in my opinion, where you can drive this as hard as you want manually, or when you're on a long road trip like this, I can just let the car drive itself. Look at this, trusting it into traffic. Yeah, it's pretty good. Self-drive. Pretty soon the cars are gonna completely drive themselves and we're not even going to need humans but anyway at 30 seconds at a time this is doing it well some of you don't like this like robot driving the car stuff but from a safety perspective it is certainly better having those park distance control sensors has saved me from hitting the front of a curb that I couldn't see uh, as well as when I'm when the cars are approaching that are in my blind spot it gives it a bit more data to work with to know if there's a car that you're gonna hit or is getting so close that it's gonna affect you. Now I'm a bit of a tech head, so having all of the computer controlled systems as well as this digital display in here is one of the huge perks over my GTI that I had is having this in here with all of this data that I can see as well as the automated systems that are in this car plus just the extra power and the all-wheel drive. So just to run down a list of all the things that I've done to this car on year one has been all of the coding changes, things like lane assist, colors in cockpit, remote fob working with ignition on, remote control windows, uh, heated seat retention, auto fan speed indicator. There's a huge list of stuff that I've done. I'm sure I'm missing a couple of big ones that I like, but th that's the majority. Um, those are major things that I like to do to any new Volkswagen that I get is to code them to how I like them. Uh, oh, I've changed it so my rear taillights are on all the time. Um, just stuff like that I really like. Oh, I also hard-coded, I also manually code changed how my rear signals work completely. I made a whole video about that as well. So I used both LED indicators on brake flashing, on signal flashing, instead of using just one outer brake light. So coding changes are the big thing that I did. Then for power mods, turbo inlet pipe which is a bigger pipe that goes into the turbo which just reduces restriction and my favorite hardware mod that I've done was the resonator delete so that was a physical change to my exhaust system which cut out a middle muffler that runs right down the middle of the car so I cut that out you put in a straight pipe and it just makes the car wake up it just adds a really really nice sound to the car DSG farts more pronounced makes everything sound better it's awesome highly recommend the resonator delete mod So, 
man tight maneuverability is a little bit worse with the R just because of the all-wheel driveness of it, but that's the only downside. Everything else is gravy. Even economy, I feel like the all-wheel drive did not make a major hit to economy. I would say that my uh, getting worse economy because this car has 100 more horsepower than the GTI and you get the traction, so I tend to use it more. Like stoplights and stop signs are a great option for that. So I'm gonna stop here. I got here first and I'm just gonna full throttle go. For power upgrades, I did turbo inlet pipe, resonator delete, and then the other power mod I did was to move my new speed power module, which is a piggyback tune box from my GTI into the R. They are compatible as the engines are similar enough and all the sensors are similar enough where I could do that. That's kind of an older style tune box now. Uh, a lot of people really like the JB1 and the JB4. A JB1 is the equivalent of my new speed power module. Pretty darn close. My, I feel like my new speed is a little bit higher spec than a JB1, but it's not as good as a JB4. A JB4 piggyback tune is a physical box that you plug into three sensors on the engine and it fools the engine into thinking that it's boosting lower than it should be and allows you to run your turbo at a higher boost level, get more fuel. It, it changes the mapping of the ECU without having to reprogram the ECU. So a lot of people like doing that because the dealership can't see that you've coded anything different in the car. They don't know that it's there. My new speed power module is a fixed flat five PSI boost over stock turbo speeds. And that is good to use on 91 to 94 octane fuel. It has a switch on the back of it where I can go to 100 octane fuel and that will give me a seven PSI turbo boost. But I have not done that because I don't run 100 octane race fuel. On wax. So I figure with the mods that I've done, I'm sitting at around 340 horsepower in this car. And I really like it. Now, I could easily go to 400 horsepower or more with a real stage one tune and probably a downpipe. And then you would be well into the 400s. I'm not sure that I want to do it. Everything I've heard so far about downpipes is that they're loud, they're stinky, and they throw off a, a engine code, even when you well, even when you buy a catted downpipe. So I'm not really sure what I want to do about that. I am sort of on the fence about going full stage one, but honestly, at around 300 wheel horsepower in this car right now, I'm fairly satisfied with it. And while it would be nice to be in the 400s, I don't really think it's worth the one to two thousand dollars to get there for me personally. The other difference in my R to my GTI is I went for the DSG in this model. Now the double clutch seven speed DSG was brand new in this year, 2018. They'd used it in Audis before, so I wasn't worried about reliability, but Previously, it was a six-speed unit, which got worse fuel economy at highway speeds, but the seven-speed is really good, and I've been very happy with the economy and performance that I've gotten out of this DSG. It is way faster than my old 2009 first-generation DSG, and I have no regrets of not going to a manual. Other than losing some of the physical engagement, I feel like the benefits that I got by going DSG outperformed my engagement factor that I would have had on a real manual because with the DSG, I get three different shift modes. I can be in drive, I can be in sport, or I can be in manual, as well as it allows you to keep power on during a shift. So you get those really awesome DSG farts. And just having an automated gearbox along with all of the other computerized systems in this car allows you to also get the radar assisted cruise control so that it will pretty much drive itself with you just with like a little pinky on your finger where it's self steering and it's self driving for long commutes. It's awesome. Another benefit that you get over going a real DSG is you get launch control. So we're gonna do that at this next stoplight here. We will do a launch. To do a launch in a Golf or a Volkswagen or an Audi, it's super simple. All you have to do is go into ESC Sport Mode, which is by pressing the traction control button once. And then you go into Sport Mode by flicking the DSG paddle down. And now all I have to do is 
come to a complete stop, your foot on the brake, give it full gas, launch control active, launching. Oh, and you get hard shifts. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. Holy shit. Wow. <laughs> Whoa, we got a 4.82, zero to 100. Stopping. Ready? Yep. Whoa! <laughs> 5.13 with two people. That's good. And that's about a zero to 16, around four and a half to four. And you just go back into normal drive mode, put your stability control back on, and you're back to cruising. Love that. Now, you do get that in a GTI as well, if you buy a DSG transmission. But launching a GTI where you're front wheel drive only, you get really bad axle hop and wheel hop. It is a, it's like a shudder through the whole car. All of my previous front wheel drive Volkswagens, when you would try and launch them hard, you would get this really awful front wheel and axle hop which there is an upgrade to by putting in heavier bushings and all this stuff that you need to try and tighten it up. But then that adds to NVH, which is uh, noise, vibration, and harshness. So not great. But when I was researching the R, I heard that it also had a wheel hop problem. That has not been the case at all. I've launched this thing probably a dozen times since I've got it in a year. I've never once had axle hop. And I've done it in winter, summer, all conditions. It's fine. Doesn't, doesn't axle hop, really like it. Now that might be an upgrade over this Mark 7.5 model. I had heard of axle hop in the Mark 7s. So who knows, maybe it was upgraded mid refresh. I don't know, but I've launched this thing a bunch of times. I've never once had my wheel hop. All right, this video is getting to be pretty long, but I'm just about to run onto the highway now and then we're gonna take the highway for a good five hours uh, to get to the area that I'm going. But overall, when, when you look at the pricing of a new GTI versus a new R, I don't see the benefit of not, I don't see the benefit of, of saving a couple of thousand dollars on a GTI now. There's a couple of GTI specific items that are really nice to, to have that you cannot have in a Golf R, and that's the tartan seats and a sunroof. Everything else is better on an R by a significant margin. So you get more power, better fit and finish, you get just a more solid feeling car because you actually have an axle going between the front and rear wheels. It's significant. Highly recommend Golf R. So in the first year of ownership, I did ceramic coating on the paint, all the coating changes that I wanted to do to the computer system to add and upgrade features. I've also done the turbo inlet pipe, the resonator delete, the new speed power module, piggyback tune, and the rest of the stuff was cosmetic, so the paddles, and a couple of other little things that I probably can't remember at this point. For year two and beyond, the things that were on my wish list that I haven't done yet has been, I want to do window tint. I would also consider like to doing a black roof and a rear spoiler extension. I've actually bought the spoiler extension, but I never put it on because I didn't quite like how it looked without the black roof. So I think I want to do the black roof and then I'll do the spoiler extension uh, and tint the windows at the same time. And that will kind of transform the look of the car, make it look a little bit more sporty in a way that I think will look better. I hate to cover up that nice pearl paint, but on the roof, I would rather have it be vinyl coated on the roof so that I can put things on it like a cup and not have to worry about the paint as much. We're about to enter into to a 400 series highway now, which has a speed limit of 110 kilometers an hour. So we'll do a little bit of a highway pull. At least that was my intent, but we've got traffic up ahead, so I can't. All right, so in year one, did I have any technical problems with the car? Not really. I've had no mechanical problems with the car. The only thing that I took it in for warranty on once was this little door that's in the center cluster here was a little bit misaligned. 
and they've just tweaked it a little bit and now it's great. So that's the only warranty thing I've done to this car was to have that front door adjusted on the center gauge cluster. Other than that, it's been ace. So what's my biggest regret year one with the Golf R? Funnily, it has nothing really to do with the Golf R, it has to do with maintenance, and that's because I took it to a dealership for its first oil change. I was supposed to get a deal through the dealership I bought it from to get 10% off all service and stuff. It didn't really work out that way. I did a basic first oil change, and that was almost a $300 bill just to change the oil in this car and do oil and lube. But whatever lubrication they used on all the door hinges and stuff was like thick and yellow, and so it's visible and it looks really ugly. So I am not impressed with that. That's the first time I've ever had an oil and lube where there was like physical gross lube all over all the hinges. I mean, sure, it's gonna make them so they stay smooth, but I'm gonna have to wipe that off. That's the other thing about cleaning this car is that I choose white because I like white. Also, white tends to look cleaner longer. It's, a, it's kind of a reverse thinking. You wouldn't think that, but it's true. Lighter cars look cleaner longer because most of the time the dust and the dirt is kind of light colored so you don't really see it as well. Interior cleanliness, there is a sea of piano black in this car. It's a lot of piano black, which is not great. I don't like piano black, but as long as you've kind of got it in your brain of like do not dry rub it, never dry rub it, it should be okay. So I have a, I have a couple of microfibers in here for just special things like doing the gloss black, kind of take care of the, caring, taking care of the dust problem. It does look really good when it's clean, but when it's not, it looks really gross. The other change that happened kind of mid-year, and this is not a GTI to R specific problem, this is kind of just a, from a, like a 2015 to 2017 versus 2018 to 2020 change, is this radio got rid of all of the hard buttons and went to touch control panel buttons on the side, which looks nicer but works worse. So when you get this, they don't even make a noise when you touch them. You have to go deep into the menu and there's an option for actually turning on a click noise when you touch them. Otherwise, you don't know if you've clicked right because they have a fairly small touch point and in the winter when it's cold, they don't work with the gloves on. So I don't like that. The screen is really nice and I use Apple CarPlay uh, a lot and all of that stuff works great. You just plug it in, works excellent. Awesome done a little bit of rambling. Uh, I, this is going to be kind of hard to cut together. I might just do it as a kind of a stream of consciousness type drive and vlog. So yeah, Golf R year one, no regrets, love it. Financially wise, this car is costing me about $100 more a month, $100 to $150 more a month than my GTI was. But this car is also worth ten dollars to $15,000 more than my GTI. Also, for Canadians, we kind of get a deal on a Golf R because I got this Golf R off the lot for $43,000. And if I was to go in and buy a brand new GTI Audubon, it would be $39,000. So for a $4,000 difference, I got a Golf R. And in 2015, when I did that same comparison, it was a ten dollars to $15,000 difference to get a Golf R. So the GTI pricing went up and the Golf R pricing stayed the same. So the value option of a Golf R got better and the value of a GTI got worse. Now the GTI did get some added features that this car has. The GTI started getting electronic differentials and the new uh, Rabbit edition that came out this year had the adaptive dampers that this does. Oh, that's the other thing. This Golf R has adaptive dampers, which allows you to have it in comfort, race, sport. It allows you to have three or four settings of suspension feel. I love that. So I keep it in comfort all the time, but I keep my drive conditions and stuff in like race feel. So I have race steering, race throttle, but comfort suspension, love that. You can do that if you buy a brand new GTI, but that GTI is gonna cost you almost 40,000 Canadian. You can get a Golf R for 43 to $45,000 Canadian. So I say if you have the means and if you like the performance and you live in a climate that warrants having all-wheel drive, get a Golf R. There's almost no downside to getting a Golf R. I absolutely love it. All right, guys, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you're new here, subscribe. If you want to talk to me, leave a comment down below. And as always, thanks for watching.